time we began trying to, we began by trying to navigate our way through Kant's moral theory. Now, fully to make sense of Kant's moral theory in the groundwork requires that we be able to answer three questions. How can duty and autonomy go together? What's the great dignity in answering to duty? It would seem that these two ideas are opposed, duty and autonomy. What's Kant's answer to that? We need someone here to speak up on Kant's behalf. Does he have an answer? Yes, go ahead, stand up. Kant believes that you only act autonomously when you are, uh, when you are pursuing something only in the name of duty and not because of your own circumstances, such as, like, you're only doing something good and more moral if you're doing it because of duty, not because of something of your own personal gain. Now, why is that acting out? What's your name? My name's Matt. Matt, why is that acting out of freedom? I, I hear what you, you're saying you about choose duty to accept those moral laws in yourself and not brought on from outside upon onto okay, you. Okay, good. Because acting out of duty yeah. is following a moral law that you impose on yourself. That you impose on yourself. That's what makes duty compatible with freedom. Yeah. Okay, that's good, Matt. That is Kant's answer. That's great. Thank you. So Kant's answer is, it is not in so far as I am subject to the law that I have dignity, but rather in so far as with regard to that very same law, I'm the author. And I'm subordinated to that law on that ground that I took it, as Matt just said, I took it upon myself. I willed that law. So that's why, for Kant, acting according to duty and acting freely, in the sense of autonomously, are one and the same. But that raises the question, how many moral laws are there? Because if dignity consists in being governed by a law that I give myself, what's to guarantee that my conscience will be the same as your conscience? Who has Kant's answer to that? Yes. Because a moral law is not contingent upon subjective conditions, it would transcend all particular differences between people, and so it would be a universal law. And in this respect, there would only be one moral law, because it would be right. supreme. That's exactly right. What's your name? Kelly. Kelly. So Kelly, Kant believes that if we choose freely, out of our own consciences, the moral law, we're guaranteed to come up with one and the same moral law. Yes. And that's because when I choose, it's not me, Michael Sanders, choosing. It's not you, Kelly, choosing for yourself. What is it exactly? Who's doing the choosing? Who's the subject? Who's the agent who's doing the choosing? Reason. Well, pure, reason. Pure reason. Pure reason. And what you mean by pure reason is what exactly? Well, pure reason is, like we were saying before, not subject to any external um, conditions that may be imposed on it. Good. So. That's great. So the reason that does the willing, the reason that governs my will when I will the moral law is the same reason that operates when you choose the moral law for yourself. And that's why it's possible to act autonomously to choose for myself, for each of us to choose for ourselves as autonomous beings, and for all of us to wind up willing the same moral law, the categorical imperative. But then there is one big and very difficult question left. Even if you accept everything that Matt and Kelly have said so far, how is a categorical imperative possible? How is morality possible? To answer that question, Kant says we need to make a distinction. We need to make a distinction between two standpoints. Two standpoints from which we can make sense of our experience. Let me try to explain what he means by these two standpoints. As an object of experience, I belong to the sensible world. There, my actions are determined by the laws of nature and by the regularities of cause and effect. But as a subject of experience, I inhabit an intelligible world. Here, being independent of the laws of nature, I am capable of autonomy, capable of acting according to a law I give myself. Now Kant says that only from this second standpoint can I regard myself as free. For to be independent of determination by causes in the sensible world is to be free. If I were wholly an empirical being, as the utilitarians assume, if I were a being wholly and only subject to the deliverances of my senses, to pain and pleasure and hunger and thirst and appetite, if that's all there were to humanity, we wouldn't be capable of freedom, Kant reasons. Because in that case, every exercise of will would be conditioned by the desire for some object. In that case, all choice would be heteronymous choice, governed by the pursuit of some external end. When we think of ourselves as free, Kant writes, we transfer ourselves into the intelligible world as members and recognize the autonomy of the will. That's the idea of the two standpoints. So how are categorical 
imperatives possible? Only because the idea of freedom makes me a member of an intelligible world. Now, Kant admits we aren't only rational beings. We don't only inhabit the intelligible world, the realm of freedom. If we did, if we did, then all of our actions would invariably accord with the autonomy of the will. But precisely because we inhabit simultaneously the two standpoints, the two realms, the realm of freedom and the realm of necessity, precisely because we inhabit both realms, there is always potentially a gap between what we do and what we ought to do, between is and ought. Another way of putting this point, and this is the point with which Kant concludes the groundwork, morality is not empirical. Whatever you see in the world, whatever you discover through science, can't decide moral questions. Morality stands at a certain distance from the world, from the empirical world. And that's why no science could deliver moral truth. Now, I want to test Kant's moral theory with the hardest possible case, a case that he raises, the case of the murderer at the door. Kant says that lying is wrong. We all know that. We've discussed why. Lying is at odds with the categorical imperative. A French philosopher, Benjamin Constant, wrote an article responding to the groundwork where he said this absolute prohibition on lying is wrong. It can't be right. What if a murderer came to your door looking for your friend who was hiding in your house? And the murderer asked you, point blank, is your friend in your house? Constant says it would be crazy to say that the moral thing to do in that case is to tell the truth. Constant says the murderer certainly doesn't deserve the truth. And Kant wrote a reply. And Kant stuck by his principle that lying even to the murderer at the door is wrong. And the reason it's wrong, he said, is once you start taking consequences into account to carve out exceptions to the categorical imperative, you've given up the whole moral framework. You've become a consequentialist or maybe a rule utilitarian. But most of you and most of Kant's readers think there's something odd and implausible about this answer. I would like to try to defend Kant on this point. And then I want to see whether you think that my defense is plausible. And I would want to defend him within the spirit of his own account of morality. Imagine that someone comes to your door. You were asked the question by this murderer. You're hiding your friend. Is there a way that you could avoid telling a lie without selling out your friend? Does anyone have an idea of how you might be able to do that? Yes, stand up. I was just going to say, if I were to let my friend in my house to hide in the first place, I'd probably make a plan with them. So I'd be like, hey, I'll tell the murderer you're here, but escape. And <laughs> that's one of the options mentioned. So. But I'm not sure that's a Kantian option. Hmm? You're still lying, though. No, because he's in the house, but he won't be. Oh, I see. <laughs> All right, good enough. One more try. If you just say you don't know where he is, because he might not be locked in the closet, he might have left the closet, you have no clue where he could be. <laughs> So you would say, I don't know, which wouldn't actually be a lie because you weren't at that very moment looking in the closet. Exactly. So it would be, strictly speaking, true. Yes. And yet possibly deceiving, misleading. But still true. <laughs> What's your name? John. John. All right, John has, uh, now John may be onto something. John, you're really offering us the option of a clever evasion that is, strictly speaking, true. This raises the question whether there is a moral difference between an outright lie and a misleading truth. From Kant's point of view, there actually is a world of difference between a lie and a misleading truth. Why is that? Even though both might have the same consequences. But then remember, Kant doesn't base morality on consequences. He bases it on formal adherence to the moral law. Now, sometimes in ordinary life, if we make exceptions for the general rule against lying with a white lie, what is a white lie? It's, it's a lie to make, well, to avoid hurting someone's feelings, for example. It's a lie that we think of as justified by the consequences. Now, Kant could not endorse a white lie, but perhaps he could endorse 
on this leading truth. Suppose someone gives you a tie as a gift, and you open the box, and it's just awful. What do you say? Thank you? You could say thank you. But they're waiting to see what you think of it. Or they ask you, what do you think of it? You could tell a white lie and say, it's beautiful. But that wouldn't be permissible from Kant's point of view. Could you say, not a white lie, but a misleading truth? You open the box and you say, I've never seen a tie like that before. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you shouldn't have. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> can you think of a contemporary political leader who engaged? <laughs> you can? Who are you thinking of? Remember the whole carefully worded denials in the Monica Lewinsky affair of Bill Clinton? Now, those denials actually became the subject of very explicit debate and argument during the impeachment hearings. Take a look at the following excerpts from Bill Clinton. Is there something, do you think, morally at stake in the distinction between a lie and a misleading, carefully couched truth? I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie, not a single time, never. These allegations are false. Did he lie to the American people when he said, I never had sex with that woman? You, you know, he, he doesn't believe he did, and because of the... What, let he me explain, may I explain, Congressman? What he said was to the American people that he did not have sexual relations. And, and I understand you're not going to like this, Congressman, because it, you will see it as a, a hair-splitting, evasive answer. But in his own mind, his definition was not... Okay, I understand that argument. Okay. All right. So there you have the exchange. Now, at the time, you, you may have thought this was just a legalistic hair-splitting exchange between a Republican who wanted to impeach Clinton and a lawyer who was trying to defend him. But now, in the light of Kant, do you think there is something morally at stake in the distinction between a lie and an evasion, a true but misleading statement? I'd like to hear from defenders of Kant, people who think there is a distinction. Are you, are you ready to defend Kant? Well, I think when you try to say that lying and misleading truths are the same thing, you're basing it on a consequentialist argument, which is that they achieve the same thing. But the fact of the matter is, you told the truth and you intended that people would believe what you were saying, which was the truth, which means it is not morally the same as telling a lie and intending that they believe it is the truth, even though it's not true. Good. What's your name? Diana. So Diana says there, that Kant has a point here, and it's a point that might even come to the aid of Bill Clinton. And that is, well, what about that? Someone over here. For Kant, motivation is key. So if you give to someone because primarily you want to feel good about yourself, Kant would say that has no moral worth. Well, with this, the motivation is the same. It's to sort of mislead someone. It's to lie. It's to sort of throw them off the track. And the motivation is the same. So there should be no difference. OK, good. So here, isn't the motive, motive the same, Diana? What, what do you say to this argument that, well, the motive is the same. In both cases, there is the attempt, or at least the hope, that one's pursuer will be misled. Uh, well, that, you could Look at it that way, but I think that the fact is that your immediate motive is that they should believe you. The ultimate consequence of that is that they might be deceived and not find out what was going on. But your immediate motive is that they should believe you because you're telling the truth. May I help a little? Sure. You and Kant. Why don't you say, and what's your name? I'm sorry. What? Why don't you say to Wesley, it's not exactly the case that the motive in both cases is to mislead. They're hoping, they're hoping that the person will be misled by the statement, I don't know where they are or I never had sexual relations. You're hoping that they will be misled, but in the case where you're telling the truth, your motive is to mislead while at the same time telling the truth and honoring the moral law and staying within the bounds of the categorical imperative. I think Kant's answer would be, Diana, yes? You like that? Okay, so I think Kant's answer would be, unlike a falsehood, unlike a lie, a misleading truth pays a certain homage to duty. And the homage it pays to duty is what justifies that the work of, even the work of evasion. Diana, yes? You like? Okay. And so there is something, some element of respect for the dignity of the moral law in the careful evasion, because Clinton could have told an outright lie, but he didn't. And so I think Kant's, Kant's insight here is in the carefully couched but true evasion, there is a kind of homage to the dignity of the moral law that is not present in the outright lie. And that, Wesley, is part of the motive. It's part of the motive. Yes, I hope he will be misled. I hope the murderer will run down 
on the road or go to the mall looking for my friend instead of the closet. I hope that will be the effect. I can't control that. I can't control the consequences. But what I can control is standing by and honoring however I pursue the ends I hope will unfold to do so in a way that is consistent with respect for the moral law. Wesley, I don't think, is entirely persuaded. But at least this brings out, this discussion brings out, some of what's at stake, what's morally at stake in Kant's notion of the categorical imperative. As long as any uh, effort is involved, I would say that the contract is valid and it should take effect. But why? What, was, what morally can you point to? For example, two people agree to be married and one suddenly calls the other and in two minutes say, I changed my mind. Does the uh, contract have obligation on both sides? Well, I'm tempted to say no. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Last time we talked about Kant's categorical imperative and we considered the way he applied the idea of the categorical imperative to the case of lying. I want to turn briefly to one other application of Kant's moral theory, and that's his political theory. Now, Kant says that just laws arise from a certain kind of social contract. But this contract, he tells us, is of an exceptional nature. What makes the contract exceptional is that it's not an actual contract that happens when people come together and try to figure out what the Constitution should be. Kant points out that the contract that generates justice is what he calls an idea of reason. It's not an actual contract among actual men and women gathered in a constitutional convention. Why not? I think Kant's reason is that actual men and women gathered in a real constitutional convention would have different interests, values, aims, and there would also be differences of bargaining power and differences of knowledge among them. And so the laws that would result from their deliberations wouldn't necessarily be just, wouldn't necessarily conform to principles of right, but would simply reflect the differences of bargaining power, the special interests, the fact that some might know more than others about law or about politics. So Kant says, a contract that generates principles of right is merely an idea of reason, but it has undoubted practical reality because it can oblige every legislator to frame his laws in such a way that they could have been produced by the united will of the whole nation. So Kant is a contractarian, but he doesn't trace the origin or the rightness of law to any actual social contract. This gives rise to an obvious question. What is the moral force of a hypothetical contract, a contract that never happened? That's the question we take up today. But in order to investigate it, we need to turn to a modern philosopher, John Rawls, who worked out in his book, A Theory of Justice, in great detail, an account of a hypothetical agreement as the basis for justice. Rawls' theory of justice, in broad outline, is parallel to Kant's in two important respects. Like Kant, Rawls was a critic of utilitarianism. Each person possesses an inviolability founded on justice, Rawls writes, that even the welfare of society as a whole cannot override. The rights secured by justice are not subject to political bargaining or to the calculus of social interests. The second respect in which Rawls' theory follows Kant's is on the idea that principles of justice, properly understood, can be derived from a hypothetical social contract, not, not an actual one. And Rawls works this out in fascinating detail with the device of what he calls the veil of ignorance. The way to arrive at the rights, the basic rights that we must respect, the basic framework of rights and duties, is to imagine that we were gathered together trying to choose the principles to govern our collective lives without knowing certain important particular facts about ourselves. That's the idea of the veil of ignorance. Now what would happen if we gathered together, just as we are here, and tried to come up with principles of justice to govern our collective life? There would be a cacophony of proposals, of suggestions, reflecting people's different interests. Some are strong, some are weak. Some are rich, some are poor. So Rawls says, imagine instead that we are gathered in an original position of equality. And what assures the equality is the veil of ignorance. 
Imagine that we are all behind a veil of ignorance which temporarily abstracts from, or brackets, hides from us, who in particular we are. Our race, our class, our place in society, our strengths, our weaknesses, whether we're healthy or unhealthy. Then, and only then, Rawls says, the principles we would agree to would be principles of justice. That's how the hypothetical contract works. What is the moral force of this kind of hypothetical agreement? Is it stronger or weaker than a real agreement, an actual social contract? In order to answer that question, we have to look hard at the moral force of actual contracts. There are really two questions here. One of them is, how do actual contracts bind me or obligate me? Question number one. And question number two, how do actual, real life contracts justify the terms that they produce? If you think about it, and this is in line with Rawls and Kant, the answer to the second question, how do actual contracts justify the terms that they produce, the answer is they don't. At least not on their own. Actual contracts are not self-sufficient moral instruments. Of any actual contract or agreement, it can always be asked, is it fair what they agreed to? The fact of the agreement never guarantees the fairness of the agreement. And we know this by looking at our own constitutional convention. It produced a constitution that permitted slavery to persist. It was agreed to. It was an actual contract. But that doesn't establish that the laws agreed to, all of them, were just. Well, then what is the moral force of actual contracts? To the extent that they bind us, they obligate in two ways. Suppose maybe here it would help to take an example. We make an agreement, a commercial agreement. I promise to pay you $100 if you will go harvest and bring to me 100 lobsters. We make a deal. You go out and harvest them and bring them to me. I eat the lobsters, serve them to my friends, and then I don't pay. And you say, but you're obligated. And I say, why? What do you say? Well, we had a deal. And you benefited. You ate all those lobsters. Well, that's a pretty strong argument. It's an argument that depends, though, on the fact that I benefited from your labor. So contracts sometimes bind us insofar as they are instruments of mutual benefit. I ate the lobsters. I owe you the $100 for having gathered them. But suppose, now take a second case. We make this deal. I'll pay you $100 for 100 lobsters. And two minutes later, before you've gone to any work, I call you back and say, I changed my mind. Now, there's no benefit. There's no work on your part. So there's no element of reciprocal exchange. What about in that case? Do I still owe you? Merely in virtue of the fact that we had an agreement? Who says, those of you who say, yes, I still owe you? Why? OK, stand up. Why do I owe you? I call you back. After two minutes, you haven't done any work. Um, I think I spent the time and effort in uh, drafting this contract with you, and also have emotional expectation that I go through the work. So you took time to draft the contract, but we did it very quickly. We just got it on the phone. That wouldn't be a formal form of contract, though. Well, I faxed it to you. It only took a minute. <laughs> as long as any uh, effort is involved, I would say that the contract is valid and it should take effect. But why? What, was, what morally can you point to that obligates me? I admit that I agreed. But you didn't go to any work. I didn't enjoy any benefit. Because one might mentally go through all the work of harvesting the lobsters. You mentally went through the work of harvesting the lobsters. <laughs> That's nothing, is it? Oh, it's not much. Is it worth $100 that you were imagining yourself going and collecting it, it may not worth $100, but it may worth something to some people. All right, I'll give you a buck for it, for that. But, but, but I, so you're still pointing, what's interesting, you're still pointing to the reciprocal dimension of contracts. You did or imagined that you did or looked forward to doing something on my behalf. For example, two people agree to be married, and one suddenly calls the other in two minutes say, I changed my mind. Does the uh, contract have obligation on both sides? <laughs> nobody has paid any um, work, or nobody has benefited yet. Well, I'm tempted to say no. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> All right. What's your name? Julian. Thank you, Julian. All right. That was good. Now, is there anyone who has who agrees with Julian that I still owe the money. For 
any other reason. Now, I have, go ahead, stand up. I think if you back out, it sort of cheapens the institution of contracts. Good, but why? Why does it? Well, I think this is kind of Kantian, but there's you know, almost, there's a certain intrinsic value in being able to make contracts and having, you know, knowing that people will expect that you'll go through with that. Good, there is some, it would cheapen the whole idea of contracts, which has to do with taking an obligation on myself. Is that, is that the idea? Yeah, I think so. What's your name? Adam. So Adam points instead, not to any reciprocal benefit or mutual exchange, but to the mere fact of the agreement itself. We see here there are really two different ways in which actual contracts generate obligations. One has to do with the act of consent as a voluntary act. And it points, Adam said this was a Kantian idea, and I think he's right, because it points to the ideal of autonomy. When I make a contract, the obligation is one that is self-imposed. And that carries a certain moral weight, independent of other considerations. And then there's a second element of the moral force of contract arguments, which has to do with the sense in which actual contracts are instruments of mutual benefit. And this points toward the ideal of reciprocity, that obligation can arise, I can have an obligation to you, insofar as you do something for me. Now, we're investigating the moral force and also the moral limits of actual contracts. And here I would like to advance an argument about the moral limits of actual contracts. Now that we know what moral ingredients do the work when people come together and say, hey, I will do this if you do that. I would like to argue first that the fact that two people agree to some exchange does not mean that the terms of their agreement are fair. When my two sons were young, they collected baseball cards and traded them. And one was, there was a two-year age, there is a two-year age difference between them. And so I had to institute a rule about the trades that no trade was complete until I had approved it. <laughs> and the reason is obvious. The older one knew more about the value of these cards and so would take advantage of the younger one. So that's why I had to review it to make sure that the agreement the agreements were fair. Now you may say, well, this is paternalism. <laughs> of course it was. That's what paternalism is for, that kind of thing. So what, what does this show? What does the baseball card example show? The fact of an agreement is not sufficient to establish the fairness of the terms. I read some years ago of a case in Chicago. There was an elderly widow, an 84-year-old widow named Rose, who had a problem in her apartment with a leaky toilet. And she signed a contract with an unscrupulous contractor who offered to repair her leaky toilet in exchange for $50,000. But she had agreed. She was of sound mind, maybe terribly naive and unfamiliar with the price of plumbing. She had made this agreement. Luckily, it was discovered. She went to the bank and asked to withdraw $25,000. And the teller said, what do you need all of that money for? And she said, well, I have a leaky toilet. <laughs> And the teller called authorities and they discovered this unscrupulous contractor. Now, I suspect that even the most ardent contractarians in the, in the room will agree that the fact of this woman's agreement is not a sufficient condition of the agreement being fair. Is there anyone who will dispute that? No one. Am I missing anyone? Alex, where are you? Where are you? So uh, maybe there's no dispute then to my first claim that, the, that an actual agreement is not necessary to their, it's not a sufficient condition of there being an obligation. I want to now make a, a stronger, maybe more controversial claim about the moral limits of actual contracts that a contract or an act of consent is not only not sufficient, but it's not even a necessary condition of there being an obligation. And the idea here is that if there is reciprocity, if, if there is an exchange, then a receipt of benefits, there can be an obligation even without an act of consent. One great example of this involves the 18th century philosopher, the Scottish moral philosopher, David Hume. When he was young, Hume wrote a book arguing against Locke's idea of an original social contract. Hume heaped scorn on this contractarian idea. He said it was a philosophical fiction, one of the most mysterious serious and incomprehensible operations that can possibly be imagined, this idea of the social contract. Many years later, when he was 62 years old, 
Hume had an experience that put to the test his rejection of consent as the basis of obligation. Hume had a house in Edinburgh. He rented it to his friend, James Boswell, who in turn sublet it to a subtenant. The subtenant decided that the house needed some repairs and a paint job. He hired a contractor to do the work. The painter did the work and sent the bill to Hume. Hume refused to pay on the grounds that he hadn't consented. He hadn't hired the painter. The case went to court. The contractor said, it's true, Hume didn't agree, but the house needed a painting and I gave it a very good one. <laughs> Hume thought this was a bad argument. The only argument this painter makes is that the work was necessary to be done, but this is no good answer because by the same rule, this painter may go through every house in Edinburgh and do what he thinks proper to be done without the landlord's consent and give the same reason, that the work was necessary and that the house was the better for it. So Hume didn't like the theory that there could be obligation to repay a benefit without consent, but the defense failed and he had to pay. Let me give you one other example of the distinction between the consent-based aspect of obligations and the benefit-based aspect and how they're sometimes run together. This is based on a personal experience. Some years ago, I was driving across the country with some friends and we found ourselves in the middle of nowhere in Hammond, Indiana. We stopped at a rest stop and got out of the car and when we came back, our car wouldn't start. None of us knew much about cars. We didn't really know what to do until we noticed that in the parking lot driving up next to us was a van and on the side it said Sam's Mobile Repair Van. And out of the van came a man, presumably Sam, and he came up to us and he said, can I help you? Here's how I work. I work by the hour for $50 an hour. If I fix your car in five minutes, you owe me the $50. And if I work on your car for an hour and can't fix it, you'll still owe me the $50. So I said, well, what is the likelihood that you'll be able to fix the car? And he didn't answer, but he did start looking under the, poking around under the steering column. Short time passed, he emerged from under the steering column and said, there's nothing wrong with the ignition system, but you still have 45 minutes left. Should I look under the hood? <laughs> I said, wait a minute. I haven't hired you. We haven't made any agreement. And then he became very angry. And he said, do you mean to say that if I had fixed your car while I was working under the steering column that you wouldn't have paid me? And I said, that's a different question. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't go into the distinction between consent-based and benefit-based <laughs> obligations. But I think he had the intuition that if he had fixed it while he was poking around, that I would have owed him the 50 bucks. I shared that intuition. I would have. But he inferred from that, this was the fallacy and the reasoning that I think lay behind his anger, he inferred from that fact that therefore, implicitly, we had an agreement. But that, it seems to me, is it's a mistake. It's a mistake that fails to recognize the distinction between these two different aspects of contract arguments. Yes, I agree, I would have owed him $50 if he had repaired my car during that time. Not because we had made any agreement, we hadn't. But simply because if he had fixed my car, he would have conferred on me a benefit for which I would have owed him in the name of reciprocity and fairness. So here's another example of the distinction between these two different kinds of arguments, these two different aspects of the morality of contract. Now I want to hear how many think I was in the right in that case. That's reassuring. Is there anyone who thinks I was in the wrong? Anyone? You do? Why? Go ahead. Isn't the problem with this is that any benefit is inherently subjectively defined? I mean, what if you wanted your car broken and he had fixed it? I mean... No, I didn't want it broken. Yeah, in but this who, case. I mean, who, would, who would? Who would? I don't know, someone. I mean, what if, what if Hume, you know, what if the painter had painted his house blue, but he hated the color blue? I mean you have to sort of define what your benefit is before the person does it. Well, all right, so we, what would you conclude from that, though, for the larger issue here? Would you conclude that therefore consent is a necessary condition of there being an obligation? Absolutely. You would. What's your name? Nate. Because otherwise, how can we know, Nate says, whether there has been an exchange of equivalent or fair benefits? Unless we have the subjective valuation, which may vary one person to the next of the situation. All right, that's a fair challenge. Let me put you one other example in order to test the relation between these two aspects of the morality of contracts. Suppose I get married, and suppose I discover that after 20 years of faithfulness on my part, every year on our trip across the country, my wife has been seeing another man. A man with a van on the Indiana Toll Road. <laughs> this part is completely made up, by the way. Wouldn't I have two different reasons for moral outrage? One reason could be we had an agreement. She broke her promise, referring to the fact of her consent. But I would also have a second ground 
for moral outrage, having nothing to do with the contract as such. But I've been so faithful for my part. Surely I deserve better than this. Is this what I'm doing in return? And so on. So that would point to the element of reciprocity. Each reason has an independent moral force. That's the general point. And you can see this if you imagine a slight variation on the marriage case. Suppose we hadn't been married for 20 years. Suppose we were just married and that the betrayal occurred on the way to our honeymoon in Hammond, Indiana. After the contract has been made, but before there is any history of performance on my part. <laughs> performance of the contract, I mean. I would still, oh, come on, come on. I would still, with, you, with Julian, I'd be able to say, but you promised, you promised. That would isolate the pure element of consent, right? Where, where there were no benefit, never mind. You get the idea. <laughs> the main idea. <laughs> Actual contracts have their moral force in virtue of two distinguishable ideals, autonomy and reciprocity. But in real life, every actual contract may fall short, may fail to realize the ideals that give contracts their moral force in the first place. The ideal of autonomy may not be realized because there may be a difference in the bargaining power of the parties. The ideal of reciprocity may not be realized because there may be a difference of knowledge between the parties. And so they may misidentify what really counts as having, having equivalent value. Now, suppose you were to imagine a contract where the ideals of autonomy and of reciprocity were not subject to contingency, but were guaranteed to be realized. What kind of contract would that have to be? Imagine a contract among parties who were equal in power and knowledge, rather than unequal, who were identically situated rather than differently situated. That is the idea behind Rawls's claim that the way to think about justice is from the standpoint of a hypothetical contract behind a veil of ignorance that creates a condition of equality by ruling out or enabling us to forget for the moment the differences in power and knowledge that, would, that could, even in principle, lead to unfair results. This is why, for Kant and for Rawls, a hypothetical contract among equals is the only way to think about principles of justice. What will those principles be? That's the question we'll turn to next time. We turn to the question of distributive justice. How should income and wealth and power and opportunities be distributed? According to what principles? John Rawls offers a detailed answer to that question. And we're going to examine and assess his answer to that question today. We put ourselves in a position to do so last time by trying to make sense of why he thinks that principles of justice are best derived from a hypothetical contract. And what matters is that the hypothetical contract be carried out in an original position of equality behind what Rawls calls the veil of ignorance. So that much is clear. All right, then let's turn to the principles that Rawls says would be chosen behind the veil of ignorance. First, he considers some of the major alternatives. What about utilitarianism? Would the people in the original position choose to govern their collective lives? Utilitarian principles, the greatest good for the greatest number. No. They wouldn't, Wall says. And the reason is that behind the veil of ignorance, everyone knows that once the veil goes up and real life begins, we will each want to be respected with dignity. Even if we turn out to be a member of a minority, we don't want to be oppressed. And so we would agree to reject utilitarianism and instead to adopt as our first principle equal basic liberties, fundamental rights to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, religious liberty, freedom of conscience, and the like. We wouldn't want to take the chance that we would wind up as members of an oppressed or a despised minority with the majority tyrannizing over us. And so Rawls says utilitarianism would be rejected. Utilitarianism makes the mistake, Rawls writes, 
of forgetting, or at least not taking seriously the distinction between persons. And in the original position behind the veil of ignorance, we would recognize that and reject utilitarianism. We wouldn't trade off our fundamental rights and liberties for any economic advantages. That's the first principle. Second principle has to do with social and economic inequalities. What would we agree to? Remember, we don't know whether we're going to wind up being rich or poor, healthy or unhealthy. We don't know what kind of family we're going to come from, whether we're going to inherit millions or whether we will come from an impoverished family. So we might, at first thought, say, well, let's require an equal distribution of income and wealth, just to be on the safe side. But then we would realize that we could do better than that, even if we're unlucky and wind up at the bottom. We could do better if we agree to a qualified principle of equality, Rawls calls it the difference principle, a principle that says only those social and economic inequalities will be permitted that work to the benefit of the least well-off. So we wouldn't reject all inequality of income and wealth. We would allow some, but the test would be, do they work to the benefit of everyone, including those, or as he specifies the principle, especially those at the bottom. Only those inequalities would be accepted behind the veil of ignorance, and so Rawls argues, only those inequalities that work to the benefit of the least well-off are just. We talked about the examples of Michael Jordan making $31 million a year, of Bill Gates having a fortune in the tens of billions. Would those inequalities be permitted under the difference principle? Only if they were part of a system, those wage differentials, that actually worked to the advantage of the least well-off. Well, what would that system be? Maybe it turns out that as a practical matter, you have to provide incentives to attract the right people to certain jobs. And when you do, having those people in those jobs will actually help those at the bottom. Strictly speaking, Rawls's argument for the difference principle is that it would be chosen behind the veil of ignorance. Let me hear what you think about Rawls's claim that these two principles would be chosen behind the veil of ignorance. Is there anyone who disagrees that they would be chosen? All right, let's start up in the balcony, if that's all right. Go ahead. Okay, your argument depends upon us believing that we would argue and set policy or justice from a bottom, for the disadvantaged. And I just don't see from a proof standpoint where, where we've proven that. Why not the top? Right. And what's your name? Mike. Mike, all right, good question. Put yourself behind the veil of ignorance. Enter into the thought experiment. What principles would you choose? How would you think it through? Well, I would say things like even Harvard's existence is an example of preaching toward the top because Harvard takes the top academics, and I didn't know when I was born how smart I would be, but I worked my life to get to a place of this caliber. Now, if you'd said Harvard's going to randomly take 1,600 people of absolutely no qualification, we'd all be saying, well, there's not much, not much to work for. And so what principle would you choose? In that situation, I would say uh, a merit-based one, where, where, one where I don't necessarily know what I have, but I'd rather have a system that rewards me based on my efforts. So you, Mike, behind the veil of ignorance, would choose a merit-based system where people are rewarded according to their efforts. All right, fair, fair enough. What would you say? Go ahead. My question is if the merit-based argument is based on um, when everyone is at a level of equality, where from that position you be, you're rewarded to where you get, or is it regardless of, of what advantages you may have when you began your education to get where you are here? I, mean, I think what, what the question you're asking is saying, you know, if you want to look at whatever utilitarian and policy is we want to maximize world wealth, and I think a system that rewards merit is the one that we've pretty much all established is what is best for, for all of us, despite the fact that some of us may be in the second percentile and some may be in the 98th percentile, and the end of the day, it lifts that lowest, that lowest base level, a, a community that rewards effort as opposed to innate differences. But I don't understand how, how you're rewarding someone's efforts who clearly has had, not, not you, but maybe myself, advantages throughout to get where I am here. I mean, I can't say that, that somebody else who maybe worked as hard as I did would have had the same opportunity to come to a school like this. All right, let's, let's look at that point. What's your name? Kate. Kate, you suspect that the ability to get into top schools may largely depend on coming from an affluent family, having a favorable back family background, social, cultural, economic advantages, and so on? I mean, economic, but yeah, social, cultural, all of those advantages, for sure. Someone did a study of the 146 selective colleges and universities in the United States. And they looked at the students in those colleges and universities to try to find out what their background was, their economic background. What percentage do you think come 
from the bottom quarter of the income scale. You know what the figure is? Only 3% of students at the most selective colleges and universities come from poor backgrounds. Over 70% come from affluent families. Let's go one step further then and try to address Mike's challenge. Rawls actually has two arguments, not one, in favor of his principles of justice, and in particular, of the difference principle. One argument is the official argument, what would be chosen behind the veil of ignorance. Some people challenge that argument saying, maybe people would want to take their chances. Maybe people would be gamblers behind the veil of ignorance, hoping that they would wind up on top. That's one challenge that has been put to Rawls. But backing up the argument from the original position is the second argument. And that is a straightforwardly moral argument. And it goes like this. It says, the distribution of income and wealth and opportunities should not be based on factors for which people can claim no credit. It shouldn't be based on factors that are arbitrary from a moral point of view. Rawls illustrates this by considering several rival theories of justice. He begins with the theory of justice that most everyone these days would reject. A feudal aristocracy. What's wrong with the allocation of life prospects in a feudal aristocracy? Rawls says, well, the thing that's obviously wrong about it is that people's life prospects are determined by the accident of birth. Are you born to a noble family or to the family of peasants and serfs? And that's it. You can't rise. It's not your doing where you wind up or what opportunities you have. But that's arbitrary from a moral point of view. And so that objection to a feudal aristocracy leads and historically has led people to say careers should be open to talents. There should be formal equality of opportunity. Regardless of the accident of birth, every person should be free to strive, to work, to apply for any job in the society. And then if you open up jobs and you allow people to apply and to work as hard as they can, then the results are just. So it's more or less the libertarian system that we've discussed in earlier weeks. What does Rawls think about this? He says it's an improvement. It's an improvement because it doesn't take as fixed the accident of birth. But even with formal equality of opportunity, the libertarian conception doesn't extend that, doesn't extend its insight far enough. Because if you let everybody run the race, everybody can enter the race, but some people start at different starting points, that race isn't going to be fair. Intuitively, he says the most obvious injustice of this system is that it permits distributive shares to be improperly influenced by factors arbitrary from a moral point of view, such as whether you got a good education or not, whether you grew up in a family that supported you and developed in you a work ethic and gave you the opportunities. So that suggests moving to a system of fair equality of opportunity, and that's really the system that Mike was advocating earlier on, what we might call a merit-based system, a meritocratic system. In a fair meritocracy, the society sets up institutions to bring everyone to the same starting point before the race begins. Equal educational opportunities, Head Start programs, for example. Support for schools in impoverished neighborhoods so that everyone, regardless of their family background, has a genuinely fair opportunity. Everyone starts from the same starting line. Well, what does Rawls think about the meritocratic system? Even that, he says, doesn't go far enough in remedying or addressing the moral arbitrariness of the natural lottery. Because if you bring everyone to the same starting point and begin the race, who's going to win the race? Who would win? To use the runner's example. The fastest runners would win. But, but is it their doing that they happen to be blessed with the athletic prowess to run fast? So Rawls says, even the principle of meritocracy, where you bring everyone to the same starting point, may eliminate the influence of social contingencies and upbringing, but it still permits the distribution of wealth and income to be determined by the natural distribution of abilities and talents. And so he thinks that the principle of eliminating morally arbitrary influences in the distribution of income and wealth requires going beyond what Mike favors, the meritocratic system. Now, how do you go beyond? If you bring everyone to the same starting point, and you're still bothered by the fact that some are fast runners and some are not fast runners, what can you do? Well, some critics of a more egalitarian conception, say the only thing you can do is handicap the fast runners. Make them wear lead shoes. But who wants to do that? 
that would defeat the whole point of running the race. But Wall says, you don't have to have a kind of leveling equality if you want to go beyond a meritocratic conception. You permit, you even encourage those who may be gifted to exercise their talents. But what you do is you change the terms on which people are entitled to the fruits of the exercise of those talents. And that really is what the difference principle is. You establish a principle that says people may benefit from their good fortune, from their luck in the genetic lottery, but only on terms that work to the advantage of the least well-off. And so, for example, Michael Jordan can make $31 million, but only under a system that taxes away a chunk of that to help those who lack the basketball skills that he's blessed with. Likewise, Bill Gates. He can make his billions, but he can't think that he somehow morally deserves those billions. Those who have been favored by nature may gain from their good fortune, but only on terms that improve the situation of those who have lost out. That's the difference principle. And it's an argument from moral arbitrariness. Rawls claims that if you're bothered by basing distributive shares on factors arbitrary from a moral point of view, you don't just reject a feudal aristocracy for a free market. You don't even rest content with a meritocratic system that brings everyone to the same starting point. You set up a system where everyone, including those at the bottom, benefit from the exercise of the talents held by those who happen to be lucky. What do you think? Is that persuasive? Who's, who finds that argument unpersuasive, the argument for moral arbitrariness? Yes? I think that in the egalitarian um, proposition, the more talented people, I think it's very optimistic to think that they would, um, would still work really hard even if they knew that part of what they made would be given away. So I think that the only way for, for the more talented people to exercise their talents to the best of their ability is is in the meritocracy. And in a meritocracy, what's your name? Kate. Kate, does it bother you, and Mike, does it bother you, that in a meritocratic system, even with fair equality of opportunity, people get ahead, people get rewards that they don't deserve simply because they happen to be naturally gifted? What about that? Um, I think that it is arbitrary, um, and obvi obviously it's arbitrary, but I think that, they're, that correcting for it would be detrimental. Um, and unlike Because it would reduce incentives, is that why? It would why? reduce incentives, yeah. Mike, what do you say? They we're all sitting in this room and we have undeserved, we have undeserved glory of some sort, that you should not be satisfied with the, pro the process of your life because you have not created any of this. And I think from a standpoint of not just this room us being upset, but from a societal standpoint, we should have some kind of a, a, a gut reaction to that feeling that, you know, the guy who runs the race, he doesn't, he actually harms us as opposed to maybe makes me run that last 10 yards faster, and that makes the guy behind me run 10 yards faster, and the guy behind him 10 yards faster. All right, so, so Mike, let me ask you, you talked about effort before. Effort. Do you think when people work hard to get ahead and succeed that they deserve the rewards that go with effort. Isn't that the idea behind your defense? I mean, of course, bring Michael Jordan here. I'm sure you can get him. And have him come and defend himself about why he makes $31 million. And I think what you're going to realize is his life was a very, very tough one to get to the top. And that we are basically being the, the majority oppressing the minority in a different light. It's All very right. easy to pick on him. Very All easy. Right. Effort. You know what? Uh, you've got, you've I've persuaded. Got I've got a few, you've but that's about it. <laughs> Effort. You know what Rawls' answer to that is? Even the effort that some people expend conscientious driving, the work ethic. Even effort depends a lot on fortunate family circumstances for which you, we, can claim no credit. Now, let's, we're gonna let, let's do the test. Let's do a test here. Never mind economic class. Those differences are very significant. Put those aside. Psychologists say that birth order makes a lot of difference in work ethic, striving, effort. How many here, raise your hand, those of you here who are first in birth order? I am too, by the way. <laughs> Mike, I noticed you raised your hand. <laughs> if the case for the meritocratic conception is that effort should be rewarded, doesn't Rawls have a point that even effort, striving, work ethic is largely shaped even by birth order? Is it your doing, Mike? Is it your doing that you were first in birth order? <laughs> then why, Rawls says, of course not. So why should income and wealth and opportunities in life be based on factors arbitrary from a moral point of view? That's a challenge that he puts to market societies, but also to those of us at places like this. A question to think about for next time. With that remarkable poll, you remember? The poll about birth order. What percentage of people in this room 
raise their hands. Was it to say that they were the firstborn? 75, 80%? And what was the significance of that if you're thinking about these theories of distributive justice? Remember, we were discussing three different theories of distributive justice, three different ways of answering the question, how should income and wealth and opportunities and the good things in life be distributed? And so far, we've looked at the libertarian answer that says the just system of distribution is a system of free exchange, a free market economy, against a background of formal equality, which simply means that jobs and careers are open to anyone. Rawls says this represents an improvement over aristocratic and caste systems because everyone can compete for every job, careers open to talents. And beyond that, the just distribution is the one that results from free exchange, voluntary transactions, no more, no less. Then Rawls argues, if all you have is formal equality, jobs open to everyone, the result is not going to be fair. It will be biased in favor of those who happen to be born to affluent families, who happen to have the benefit of good educational opportunities. And that accident of birth is not a just basis for, for distributing life chances. And so many people who notice this unfairness, Rawls argues, are led to embrace a system of fair equality of opportunity. That leads to the meritocratic system, fair equality of opportunity. But Rawls says, even if you bring everyone to the same starting point in the race, what's going to happen? Who's going to win? The fastest runners. So once you're troubled by basing distributive shares on morally arbitrary contingencies, you should, if you reason it through, be carried all the way to what Rawls calls the democratic conception, a more egalitarian conception of distributive justice that he defines by the difference principle. Now, he doesn't say that the only way to remedy or to compensate for differences in natural talents and abilities is to have a kind of leveling equality, a guaranteed equality of outcome. But he does say there's another way to deal with these contingencies. People may gain, may benefit, from their good fortune, but only on terms that work to the advantage of the least well-off. And so we can test how this theory actually works by thinking about some pay differentials that arise in our society. What does the average school teacher make in the United States, do you suppose? Roughly. It's a little more, 40, 42,000. What about David Letterman? How much do you think David Letterman makes? More than a school teacher? $31 million, David Letterman. Is that fair that David Letterman makes that much more than a school teacher? Well, Rawls's answer would be, it depends whether the basic structure of society is designed in such a way that Letterman's $31 million is subject to taxation so that some of those earnings are taken to work for the advantage of the least well-off. One other example of a pay differential. A justice of the United States Supreme Court. What do they make? It's, it's just under $200,000. Here's Sandra Day O'Connor, for example. There she is. But there's another judge who makes a lot more than Sandra Day O'Connor. <laughs> Do you know who it is? <laughs> judge Judy. How did you know that? <laughs> you watch? No, but you're, you're right. Judge Judy, you know how much she makes? There she is. $25, $25 million. Now, is that just? Is it fair? Well, the answer is it depends whether this is against a background system in line with the difference principle, where those who come out on top in terms of income and wealth are taxed in a way that benefits the least well-off members of society. Now, we're going to come back to these wage differentials, pay differentials, between a real judge and a TV judge, the one Marcus watches all the time. What I want to do now is return to these theories and to examine the objections to Rawls's more egalitarian theory, the difference principle. There are at least three objections to Rawls's difference principle. One of them came up last time in the discussion, and a number of you raised this worry. What about incentives? Isn't there the risk if taxes reach 
70, 80, 90 percent marginal rate that Michael Jordan won't play basketball, that David Letterman won't do late night comedy, or that CEOs will go into some other line of work. Now, who among those who are defenders of brawls, who has an answer to this objection about the need for incentives? Yes, go ahead, stand up. Rawls's idea is that there should only be so much difference that it helps the least well-off the most. So if there's too much equality, then the least well-off might not be able to watch late-night TV or might not have a job because their CEO doesn't want to work. So you need to find the correct balance where taxation still leaves enough incentive for the least well-off to benefit from the talents. Good. And what's your name? Tim. Tim. All right. So Tim is saying, in effect, that Rawls takes account of incentives and could allow for pay differentials and for some adjustment in the tax rate to take account of incentives, but Tim points out the standpoint from which the question of incentives needs to be considered is not the effect on the total size of the economic pie, but instead from the standpoint of the effect of incentives or disincentives on the well-being of those at the bottom. Right? Good. Thank you. I think that is what Rawls would say. In fact, if you look in section 17, where he describes the difference principle, he allows for incentives. The naturally advantaged are not to gain, merely because they are more gifted, but only to cover the cost of training and education and for using their endowments in ways that help the less fortunate as well. So you can have incentives. You can adjust the tax rate if taking too much from David Letterman or from Michael Jordan or from Bill Gates winds up actually hurting those at the bottom. That's the test. So incentives, that's not a decisive objection against Rawls' difference principle. But there are two weightier, more difficult objections. One of them comes from defenders of a meritocratic conception. The argument that says, what about effort? What about people working hard, having a right to what they earn because they've deserved it, they've worked hard for it? That's the objection from effort and moral desert. Then there's a, another objection that comes from libertarians. And this objection has to do with reasserting the idea of self-ownership. Doesn't the difference principle, by treating our natural talents and endowments as common assets, doesn't that violate the idea that we own ourselves? Now, let me deal first with the objection that comes from the libertarian direction. Milton Friedman writes in his book, Free to Choose, life is not fair. And it's tempting to believe that government can rectify what nature has spawned. But his answer is, the only way to try to rectify that is to have a leveling equality of outcome, everyone finishing the race at the same point, and that would be a disaster. This is an easy argument to answer. And Rawls addresses it in one of the most powerful passages, I think, of a theory of justice. It's in section 17. The natural distribution, and here he's talking about the natural distribution of talents and endowments, is neither just nor unjust. Nor is it unjust that persons are born into society at some particular position. These are simply natural facts. What is just and unjust is the way that institutions deal with these facts. That's his answer to libertarian laissez-faire economists like Milton Friedman who say life is unfair, but get over it. Get over it and let's see if we can at least maximize the benefits that flow from it. But the more powerful libertarian objection to Rawls is not libertarian from the libertarian economists like Milton Friedman. It's from the argument about self-ownership, developed as we saw in Nozick. And from that point of view, yes, it might be a good thing to create Head Start programs and public schools so that everyone can go to a decent school and start the race at the same starting line. That might be good. But if you tax people to, to create public schools, if you tax people against their will, you coerce them. It's a form of theft. If you take some of Letterman's 31 million, tax it away to, to support public schools against his will, the state is really doing no better than stealing from him. It's coercion. And the reason is we have to think about ourselves as owning our talents and endowments. Because otherwise we're back to just using people and coercing people. That's the libertarian reply. 
What's Rawls' answer to that objection? He doesn't address the idea of self-ownership directly. But the effect, the moral weight of his argument for the difference principle is maybe we don't own ourselves in that thoroughgoing sense after all. Now, he says this doesn't mean that the state is an owner in me in the sense that it can simply commandeer my life. Because remember, the first principle we would agree to behind the veil of ignorance is the principle of equal basic liberties, freedom of speech, religious liberty, freedom of conscience, and the like. So the only respect in which the idea of self-ownership must give way comes when we're thinking about whether I own myself in the sense that I have a privileged claim on the benefits that come from the exercise of my talents in a market economy. And Rawls says, on reflection, we don't. We can defend rights. We can respect the individual. We can uphold human dignity without embracing the idea of self-possession. That, in effect, is his reply to the libertarian. I want to turn now to his reply to the defender of a meritocratic conception, who invokes effort as the basis of moral desert. People who work hard to develop their talents deserve the benefits that come from the exercise of their talents. Well, we've already seen the beginning of Rawls's answer to that question, and it goes back to that poll we took about birth order. His first answer is, even the work ethic, even the willingness to strive conscientiously, depends on all sorts of family circumstances and social and cultural contingencies for which we can claim no credit. You can't claim credit for the fact that you, most of you, most of us, happen to be first in birth order, and that for some complex psychological and social reasons, that seems to be associated with striving, with achieving, with effort. That's one answer. There's a second answer. Those of you who invoke effort, you don't really believe that moral desert attaches to effort. Take two construction workers. One is strong and can raise four walls in an hour without even breaking a sweat. And another construction worker is small and scrawny and has to spend three days to do the same amount of work. No defender of meritocracy is going to look at the effort of that weak and scrawny construction worker and say, therefore, he deserves to make more. So it isn't really effort. This is the second reply to the meritocratic claim. It isn't really effort that the defender of meritocracy believes is the moral basis of distributive shares. It's contribution. How much do you contribute? But contribution takes us straight back to our natural talents and abilities, not just effort. And it's not our doing how we came into the possession of those talents in the first place. All right, suppose you accepted these arguments, that effort isn't everything, that contribution matters from the standpoint of the meritocratic conception, that effort even isn't our own doing. Does that mean, the objection continues, does that mean that according to Rawls, moral desert has nothing to do with distributive justice? Well, yes. Distributive justice is not about moral desert. Now, here, Rawls introduces an important and a tricky distinction. It's between moral desert on the one hand and entitlements to legitimate expectations on the other. What is the difference between moral deserts and entitlements? Consider two different games, a game of chance and a game of skill. Take a game of pure chance. Say I play the Massachusetts State Lottery, and my number comes up. I'm entitled to my winnings. But even though I'm entitled to my winnings, there's no sense in which, because it's just a game of luck, no sense in which I morally deserve to win in the first place. That's an entitlement. Now contrast the lottery with a different kind of game, a game of skill. Now, imagine the Boston Red Sox winning the World Series. When they win, they're entitled to the trophy. But it can be always asked of a game of skill, did they deserve to win? It's always possible, in principle, to distinguish what someone's entitled to under the rules and whether they deserve to win in the first place. That's an antecedent standard, moral desert. Now, Rawls says distributive justice is not a matter of moral desert, though it is a matter of entitlements to legitimate expectations. Here's where 
where he explains it. A just scheme answers to what men are entitled to. It satisfies their legitimate expectations, is founded upon social institutions. But what they are entitled to is not proportional to, nor dependent on their intrinsic worth. The principles of justice that regulate the basic structure do not mention moral desert, and there is no tendency for distributive shares to correspond to it. Why does Rawls make this distinction? What morally is at stake? One thing morally at stake is the whole question of effort that we've already discussed. But there's a second contingency, a second source of moral arbitrariness that goes beyond the question of whether it's to my credit that I have the talents that enable me to get ahead. And that has to do with the contingency that I live in a society that happens to prize my talents. The fact that David Letterman lives in a society that puts a great premium, puts a great value on a certain type of smirky joke, that's not his doing. He's lucky that he happens to live in such a society. But this is a second contingency. This isn't something that we can claim credit for. Even if I had sole unproblematic claim to my talents and to my effort, it would still be the case that the benefits I get from exercising those talents depend on factors that are arbitrary from a moral point of view. What my talents will reap in the market economy, what does that depend on? What other people happen to want or like in this society. It depends on the law of supply and demand. That's not my doing. Certainly not the basis for moral desert. What counts as contributing depends on the qualities that this or that society happens to prize. Most of us are fortunate to possess, in large measure, for whatever reason, the qualities that our society happens to prize. The qualities that, that enable us to provide what society wants. In a capitalist society, it helps to have entrepreneurial drive. In a bureaucratic society, it helps to get on easily and smoothly with superiors. In a mass democratic society, it helps to look good on television and to speak in short, superficial sound bites. <laughs> in a litigious society, it helps to go to law school and to have the talents to do well on LSATs. But none of this is our doing. Suppose that we, with our talents, inhabited not our society, technologically advanced, highly litigious, but a hunting society or a warrior society. What would become of our talents then? They wouldn't get us very far. No doubt some of us would develop others. But would we be less worthy? Would we be less virtuous? Would, be, would we be less meritorious if we lived in that kind of society rather than in ours? Rawls' answer is no. We might make less money, and properly so. But while we would be entitled to less, we would be no less worthy, no less deserving than we are now. And here's the point. The same could be said of those in our society who happen to hold less prestigious positions, who happen to have fewer of the talents that our society happens to reward. So here's the moral import of the distinction between moral desert and entitlements to legitimate expectations. We are entitled to the benefits that the rules of the game promise for the exercise of our talents. But it's a mistake and a conceit to suppose that we deserve in the first place a society that values the qualities we happen to have in abundance. Now we've been talking here about income and wealth. What about opportunities and honors? What about the distribution of access, of seats in elite college and universities. It's true. All of you, most of you firstborn, worked hard, strived, developed your talents to get here. But Rawls asks, in effect, what is the moral status of your claim to the benefits that attach to the opportunities you have? Our seats in colleges and universities a matter, a kind of reward, an honor for those who deserve them because they've worked so hard? Or are those seats, those opportunities and honors entitlements to legitimate expectations that depend for their justification on those of us who enjoy them doing so in a way that works to the benefit of those at the bottom of society? That's the question that Rawls' difference principle poses. It's a question that can be asked of the earnings of Michael Jordan and David Letterman and Judge Judy, but it's also a question that can be asked of opportunities to go to the top colleges and universities. And that's a debate that comes out when we turn to the question of affirmative action next time. <laughs>